Welcome to the lectures for Organization of Programming Languages, or uh, OPL will abbreviate it. Um, in this class, we'll be talking about how to implement programming languages, um, and how to implement features of programming languages, and how to know what programs in languages mean. Um, these three ideas about implementing programming languages, implementing language features, and understanding understanding what programs mean are all different aspects of the field of programming languages. And each one tends to use similar tools. So when we talk about how to understand what programs mean, typically what we mean is to represent mathematically the, um, the behavior of a program so we can uh, predict what it should do before we ever actually run it. Also, if we can have a mathematical definition of what it's supposed to do, we can then evaluate an actual implementation like a compiler or an interpreter to determine whether or not that program has an error in it. Given that we can use these things to use a semantics to predict the meaning of a program, they can also guide the actual implementation of the implementation, say the, um, say the compiler or the interpreter. And sometimes um, we'll be able to implement features of languages inside of the language itself rather than actually extending the interpreter uh, or compiler or whatever. And that can then be a guide to um, to representing uh, new language features in some existing programming language. In the course um, uh, on the website, um, there's a large project which will have you working on building your own um, interpreter for a language that is going to start off basically like a calculator, but eventually um, it will become like a uh, like a version of JavaScript or something like that. <clears throat> uh, to get started with this concept, I want to first talk about what exactly a program is. So what is a program? Now, if you're familiar with uh, Foundations of Computer Science, um, you may recall that we often see programs, computers, algorithms as all different names for the same underlying idea uh, of a, a computation that you know someone can think about or you know a procedure for uh, solving some some problem. Um, although that is a very fruitful way to think about computation um, theoretically and maybe philosophically even. Um, let's be a little bit more mundane in this class when we talk about what exactly a program is. So, <clears throat> for many people, what a program is is simply uh, some programming language syntax, which is really like a string. So, for example, they might say something like, well, a program is something like a string that has a statement like return 1 plus 2 times 3. And this right here is a program, and this program right here, we could ask how many pieces does it have, and they might say something like, well it has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 pieces, because the thing that a program is, is a string with 17 characters. A 17 character string. Now this is certainly the way that many um, programming language tools think about programs. For example, when you use Emacs or Vim or Ed or something like that and you're modifying a program, you're modifying that program as a string. You're manipulating a string and modifying that string over time. Then when you're ready to run the program or compile it, you take this string, you know, of course, in a file, and then you send it into the compiler, uh, which then 
turns it into another string, for instance, a binary string. Now the thing is, understanding a program as a string uh, is not a very high, um, what's the right word for this? Um, it's not a method of understanding one that allows you to do a lot with it. Um, instead, and one of the ways that we can tell that is that inside of compilers and interpreters, the very first thing that they do is they take this string right here and they turn it into a tree. A tree that records the relationship between the fundamental blocks inside of uh, the fundamental pieces of this particular program. And in particular, most languages are going to turn this um, they're going to turn this particular string into the following tree. They're going to turn it into a node that's labeled return that has one child, and that child is a node labeled plus, and one child, which is a node labeled one, and another node labeled times with one child that's a two, and one child that's a three. And it's this tree right here that is more likely to be understood as the program uh, in many programming languages. And we would say that this one has one, two, three, four, five, six. So a six node tree. Now, this perspective on what the program is, is the way that, um, the way that we adopt um, in this course and throughout all of program language study. This is what we think a program is. We don't really think of it as being this string, we think of it as being this tree. Now, of course, part of program languages is um, implementing parsers that turn strings like this into trees like that. Um, but that's kind of a boring field of uh, just parsing that doesn't really have much to do um, with really defining you know, the, the interesting behavior of programming languages. Uh, so we'll kind of ignore that in this class and we'll just focus on these trees themselves. Sometimes we'll write things like this and we'll implicitly imagine that, uh, that you're writing a tree. Um, now there are some programming languages, uh, some programming language tools that allow you to directly manip manipulate these trees. These are called uh, structured code editors. Structured code editors. Um, and I think the most famous one of these is uh, the Scratch programming environment. So in Scratch, you manipulate programs that are explicitly represented as tree-like blocks, uh, and you manipulate them that way. All right, so now that we understand what a program is in general, let's look at our first kind of programming language. And we're going to take this very simple programming language and use it to, um, uh, to sort of drive our study. We're going to start with this language and then slowly add features to it. We're going to make a sequence of programming languages that are going to, it's called the J family of languages, named after me, of course. And our first one is going to be called J0. And so J0 is a programming language that has only, um, only two different kinds of things. It has expressions, which we abbreviate as an E, and values, which we abbreviate as a V. And values are always numbers, and expressions are either values, or they are trees that are labeled with a plus with two children, or they are trees labeled with a times and two children. So notice that what I've done is I've defined two categories, E and V. I've used this little uh, bar symbol right here to stand in for the word or. So we'll say that an expression is either a V or a node with a plus and two children or a node with a times and two children and a V are numbers. So, for example, an element inside of E would be something like the following, a plus with one child being a one and the other child being a times 
where one child is a 2 and the other child is a 3. This is an example program. This thing right here is inside of j0.e. Okay. Now, it is a little bit tedious to write down these trees, especially because they take a lot of space. Sometimes we'll abbreviate them um, in this parenthetical notation right here. And we would write this same tree right here in the following way. We would write plus 1 times 2, 3. Now, if you're familiar with some programming languages, there are some programming languages whose syntax looks exactly like this. For example, lisp, scheme, racket, closure, uh, and a number of other languages have a parenthetical syntax like this. Um, the reason that those languages have the syntax uh, is essentially because, um, I don't know, you might say that their authors are lazy. I mean, there are some things that are desirable about this. It has some uniformity properties that are nice. Um, we're just using this notation um, because it is uh, quick to write down. Um, and it allows us to not focus very much on the idea of parsing, which is, of course, an interesting idea. Now, a tree like this, and this data, and this uh, uh, this um, e data type, we can turn into a um, a data structure in our programming language. So, for example, suppose that we were going to write um, an implementation of this language in Java. What we might do is we might define an interface called a J expression. And then what we might do is define a class called a J number that implements J expression. We might, I d notice I used a capital N there, but not a capital E. I'm going to change this to a capital E. That is more beautiful. OK. And then this class is going to have one field, int n. And then its constructor, jnum, will take as an argument that n, and it will say this dot n equals n. Okay. So now what I've done is I've been able to construct a class that stores a number. I could then make another class. Let's call it j plus that implements j expression, and this is going to have two fields that are both j expressions, the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And its constructor would be, you know, j plus j expression, left-hand side, right-hand side, and you know, you know what to do there. You would just assign them. Okay? We would have another class called j mult that implements j expression and there would be two fields the left hand side and the right hand side and so on okay so these three classes together they describe this same setup right here the interface j expression is like this category e here and each one of these pieces is a different class. And I could take this object right here, this program, where we have a plus on a plus with a one on the left, a times with a two on the left. We could write this as the following expression in Java. We would write new j plus new j number one new j mult new j number two new j number three now what i've done is i've written in the programming language of java this data structure right here this is an interesting thing that you can do with um 
programming languages, I can write an implementation of one programming language in another. In this case, I've defined the data structure for the programming language J0 inside of Java. There's a special lingo that we use for this. We say that Java is a meta language and J0 is an object language. All right, so once we have a data structure like this that describes programs inside of our language, what we could do is we can then start analyzing and manipulating those programs. For example, a really basic thing that we could do is we could write a function that takes those trees and prints them out as strings. We'll write a function called pp, and what it does is it's going to take an expression and return a string. So for instance, if we call pp on a number, it would return, you know, like as string the number. And if we called pp on a plus with the left hand side and a right hand side, then what we would do is we would do something like, um, you know, a left parenthesis, a plus, and then we would um, append that on to the left hand side as a string and then a space, and then the right-hand side, and then a close parenthesis. And similarly, for a times, we could do the same. pp left-hand side, pp right-hand side, all right, so now you've written a little function that converts these E data structures into strings. Of course, what I've done here, we could just as well do inside of our programming language. For example, we could write down, we could add to our interface of J expressions a new function that would be called public string pp, all right, then we could define inside of our class, and this right here, this line right here kind of corresponds to this right here, our new, we could define inside of our class jnum a function called public string pp, and what it would do is it would return n dot, I don't know, like, i2s, I think is what it's called, integer to string. I don't know if that's what, I don't really write a lot of Java programs. So there's some function like that. Okay, and that line right there corresponds to this line up here. Next we could write uh, inside of our class for plus, j plus, oops, public string pp, we could write a function that says return the plus plus left hand side dot pp plus a space plus right hand side dot pp plus the closing parenthesis. And now what we've done, and that of course corresponds to this line right here, and there'd be a similar one for that. What we've now done is we've converted our trees back into strings. Now, as I mentioned, normal programming languages also have a function that will convert a that will convert a uh, a string into one of these things, uh, one of these trees. Um, this is called a parser, and We'll, um, we'll forget about that for a moment, and we may come back to it um, a little bit later. Okay, so the next thing that I'd like to talk about
That was an example of one function that we could write that manipulates our program objects. What's another kind of program that we might write to manipulate them? Well, the most important thing about a programming language tends to be what the program means. Okay, so the most important thing, important thing is what a program means. Now, there are a variety of techniques for describing what a program means. I think the most intuitive one is called a big step semantics. Also called a big step interpreter. A big step interpreter is a function that we traditionally call interp. And what it does is it takes an expression and returns a value. Now, every programming language is going to define some concept of what can be interpreted. In our J0 language, those are expressions. In a language like C, there are programs, there are functions, there are statements, and there are expressions. So there's a whole bunch of different categories of values. Some people find a language that divides up the different pieces of programs into these different categories helpful. Other people don't like it. They only they want there to be just one category. Um, in most of our languages, we're going to focus on languages with only one category and expression. These are so-called expression-oriented languages. Um, but the difference is not really significant. Similarly, each language will define its own concept of what a value is, what a meaningful answer is. So for example, you know, the programming language HTML, what are its values? What does it mean to run an HTML program? In some sense, the way to run an HTML program is to produce an image on a screen, what the web page looks like. Whereas to run a C program um, is to create some change in memory. In our language, we're going to take expressions and when what their meaning is will always be a number, because recall V is really just a number. So a big step semantics is essentially an implementation of the programming language written inside of math. For example, we would say something like, if you're going to interpret a number, the answer is just that number. If you're going to interpret a addition operation with an expression on the left and an expression on the right, then you're then the answer is to interpret the expression on the left and then add that to interpreting the expression on the right. To interpret a multiplication with something on each side is to interpret the thing on the left and then interpret the thing on the right. Okay, now let's take a look at this line of math right here. We could convert this into a language like Java in the following way. Inside of our class for a jmult, what we would do is we would implement a function called public int interp, which of course we would add because of this line right here to the interface inside of the interface for a j expression we would say that there is a public int interp function. Okay, And what is the implementation of this function? Well, it's quite simple, actually. We would write return this dot left hand side dot interp. And then we would multiply that by this dot right hand side dot interp. Close the interp function, close the mult. So a line like this we can always convert into a <coughs> um, into a corresponding line inside of a language like Java or C or something like that.
in the notes, sorry, not in the notes, in the assignment, when I say something like write a test case for a function or a test suite for a language, what I mean is write down a large number of pairs of the form like, well, on the left we're going to have a J0 program and on the right we're going to have its meaning. So we could build a little table. So we'll say, for example, the program 1 means 1. The program plus 1, 2 means 3. The program plus negative 1, 1 means 0. The program times negative 1, 8 means negative 8. The program times 2, 2 means 4. The program plus 1 times 2, 3 means 7, and so on. This is an example of a test suite or examples. And we can turn these into programs, uh, sorry, into, um, into uh, unit tests on our interp function. We could write something like this. We could write check that calling interp on, oh, whoops, We could write new j plus new j num one new j num two. Okay, so that's the end of plus. That's the end of that parenthesis. Dot interp. Actually, you know what? Yeah, let's do this. Let's just write a function. It's called check. And we can write down what it's supposed to return. We'll write down new jnum3. Okay? So now this check function, what it would do is it would take an expression for the e and an expression for the result. I guess we should really shouldn't have it be that. It should be an integer. Let's fix that. to take as an argument three, and then int, we'll call this e answer for expected answer, and it would do something like if e dot interp does not equal e answer, then error. That's a really simple function that we can write that will allow us to take a table like this and take a single row like this one and turn it into a function call. And then we can write lots of these inside of our program and every time we make a change to our program we can verify that it's doing everything correctly. All right. <coughs> Just looking at my list of things I want to talk about. Okay. All right. Now, suppose though that you find it annoying to write these new things over and over again. What you could do is you could write a parser. You could write a parser that takes a string and returns an E. Now, as I mentioned before, writing parsers like this is annoying. There are many tools that help you do that, like Antler and Yak and Bison. These are tools that um, are designed for helping produce these parsers. There's another strategy that is quite easy to do, um, where rather than writing a parser like this, what you do is you first write what's called a reader. And what a reader does is it takes a string and turns it into something called an S expression. That stands for a string expression. And then another function that we call dsugar. And this takes an S expression and it returns an E. So I'm gonna call this complicated. And we're gonna call this less complicated. Okay, 
So, what is an S expression? An S expression is, we denote by a type called SE, and it is either a string or a number. Collectively, we call these things atoms. Or it is a list of S expressions. This dot 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 means one, zero or more, so many of them. The thing that's nice about S expressions is it is very simple to write a reader for them. I'm going to post on the site an example of a reader written in C. And it's very straightforward how it works. Essentially, all you do is you read one character at a time. If the character that you read is a string, then, sorry, is a, um, is a, a number, then you know that you're going to get a number. And if the character that you read is not a number, then you know it's going to be a string, unless it's a left parenthesis, in which case you know that you've gotten a list. So this is an example of a language that is very trivial to parse, because you will always know from, what's the right way to say this, uh, from looking at only one character at a time what it's going to be. So I'm going to post an implementation of a reader um, in C um, on the site. C site for one dot s expression dot C. And that's going to be an implementation in C. And my hope is, is that it will be easy for um, anyone to be able to look at this implementation um, and write a similar implementation in whatever programming language they'd like to use if they want to write a reader. But if you don't want to write a reader, then what you could do is you could just construct S expressions by hand. So for instance, if we were to look at the S expression plus one times two, three, we could write this as the following S expression. It would be new list that's this case right here. And sometimes we call a list like this a cons. So we say cons s e s e and null because you know a list is really like a linked list, right? So here let me write it in that form. So we have actually let me let me write it with brackets. I think that'll be cleaner. So we have a list where there's a plus, then there's a one, then there's another list with a times, a two, and a three. So notice that your language probably makes it easy to write something like this. So for instance, if you're writing in JavaScript or Python, it's very easy to write that down directly. And that you could call that an S expression. And um, or you could, if you're writing in a language like Java, well then this is really a linked list where we have you know, a list of objects. So S expressions are just this all-encompassing idea about how to write down, um, uh, write down structured data with a very minimal interpretation of what it means. The interpretation then comes from this desugar function. So what desugar does is it takes an S expression, sometimes people pronounce that as sexper, sexper, and returns an E. For example, in our language, we could write down desugar of a number, will be that number, desugar of, I'll, I'll use um, uh, brackets of plus, L R would be a plus of calling D sugar on the L and D sugar on the R, and then calling D sugar on a times L R would be calling times D sugar on the L and desugar on the R. 
Now let's look at one of these, let's look at this line right here, and see what that would look like inside of Java. Inside of Java it would look like this. We would have an if that would say if the extra restriction length that we have been given, if its length is equal to 3, because we have 1, 2, 3, and if the first thing inside of the S expression is equal to plus, then what we would do is we would return a new J plus that came from calling D sugar on the S expression 1, that's the left, and D sugar on the thing on the right. Okay? And so our D sugar function, it wouldn't be organized in terms of uh, like one um, one class per line like the other things. It would be some it would be one big giant function that had rules like this. Now here's an example to talk about kind of the first big idea in um, programming languages, which is that sometimes it can pay to implement a feature purely in your desugarer rather than implementing it inside of your language. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that our J0 language, recall that it has numbers, it has pluses, and it has multiplies. And pluses always take exactly two arguments. Multiplies always take exactly two arguments. There's no subtraction, and isn't that, uh, and there's no like unary uh, operations either. What we could do is we could make something that's going to be called J0 surface. Okay? And J0 surface is going to include numbers, it'll include addition with zero or more things, multiplication with zero or more things, it'll include unary um, negation, and it'll include subtraction. Now we can create this surface language by purely adding cases to our desugarer. Here's what I mean by that. We can put in our desugarer the following rule. We can write desugarer of minus e will turn into calling desugarer on times minus 1 e. So we're going to take a unary subtraction and turn it into a multiply by negative 1. We can desugarer a binary subtraction, el, er, to calling desugarer on a plus of el and a minus on er. Okay. Now, notice that it's kind of tedious to write desugarer on both sides, so let's just skip that and just write the things. So what if we have a single plus all by itself? Well, let's just turn that um, into zero. What if we have a plus with el and then em, that's for more, we could turn that into, in this case, I do want to elaborate a little bit. We could turn this into a plus operation with calling desugarer on el, and then also calling desugarer on a plus of em dot dot dot. And we could have a similar rule for multiply, where a multiply by itself becomes 1, and then we could have a, a similar rule like that for multiply. 
Now, let's look at an example of what really one of these cases mean. So let's look at this right here. What would this really look like in Java? It would look like the following. There would be an if that would say, if the length of the S expression was greater than or equal to one, and the first thing was equal to a plus, then what we would do is we would return a new j plus where we called dsugar on, uh, oh sorry, that says two, but it's supposed to, that says one, but it's supposed to say two, on dsugar of one, and then we're going to call dsugar, dsugar, on a new cons, that's a new linked list node, with se0, and then se2 dot dot dot. So everything that comes after one. OK? And this, this one case right here would turn into an if inside of our dsugar function. This then would allow us to have a large number of, um, of a, like a more expressive, more, uh, more interesting surface language, because we could have multi-area addition, multi-area multiplication, unary subtraction, and then normal subtraction. So this is a principle of building programming languages where rather than implementing a feature directly, we implement it purely inside of the Dishugger. So as the last thing for today, let's expand our programming language a bit into something that we're going to call J1. So the J1 language is going to have expressions, which could be values, or there could be an expression followed by some arguments, or there could be an if statement with exactly three pieces. And what are values? Values are drawn from B, and B is some set of constants, some set of constants. In particular, let's have them be numbers, booleans, i.e. true and false, and what are called primitives. And primitives will be Things like addition, multiplication, maybe subtraction, maybe division, maybe, you know, less than or equal to, less than, equal, greater than, greater than or equal to, etc. The idea behind this J1 language is, is that by separating out the idea of a constant from the core forms inside the language, we can forget about the details of exactly what primitives um, and constants there are and focus on just the high level of what the language means. So it has the following interpreter. A value, it always evaluates to itself. An if statement that has a expression for the condition an expression for the true branch, an expression for the false branch, is equal to interpreting ek, where ek is equal to if interpret of ec is equal to true, then et otherwise, actually, you know what? Um, 
Let's change that. We'll say that if it's if it's equal to false, then it'll be EF. Otherwise, it'll be ET. And then the last rule, so this means that it's like C, where 0 uh, is false, and then it doesn't matter what everything else is. It will just be the true case. And then if we have an interp of EF and ERG, dot, 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 then this is going to be equal to this function called delta of p v arg dot 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 where p is equal to calling interp on ef and v arg is equal to calling interp on erg. Okay. And p, by the way, is assumed to be inside of the set of primitives. Now we imagine that the delta function is defined something like this, where delta of plus 1, 2 is equal to 3, and delta of less than 1, 3 is equal to true. And you know, delta of div of uh, of divide. Let me write it like that. Of divide one zero is just undefined. And so this delta function is a partial function. So delta is a partial function that defines what primitives means. That defines what prims mean. The idea here is that we can focus on this language, this J1 language, and we can ignore the details of exactly what set of constants there are, exactly what primitives there are, and exactly what those primitives mean, and we can focus on just these core three rules. The idea that values evaluate to themselves, ifs select one of the two branches, and when you interpret a function call, you look up the function, you interpret the argument, and then you just do some, um, some primitive operation determined by the name of the function you call. All right. Um, I want to mention one more thing. In the assignments, it says to define a data structure to represent this. So we've already showed how to represent one for J0, so you should do something similar for this. You should write a test suite of example programs. Um, you should extend your desugarer to work on the exact same surface language, but output these things. So for instance, um, when it was given, you know, you'll want to support, um, you know, multi-aried addition uh, with this. You can assume that addition is really only works on binary things, on two things. Um, and you could implement the interp function like this on the expanded language. All right, uh, that's enough for now. We'll see you next time.